Bremel Diggers Podcast başlıyor. Hello and welcome everyone to the 16th episode of the Gravel Diggers podcast, uh, which is supported by Santini Turkey. Uh, I'm with uh, Bura today and we have a very special uh, record breaker guest again with us. Uh, Juliana Buffering is our guest today. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you, Juliana, for uh, accepting our invites and welcome to the show. Uh, how are you? Thanks. Thank you for inviting me. I feel very honored. I'm Thank you. I'm well. I'm tired. I've been building my house today, so it means I've been carrying <laughs> rocks up and down the mountain. Uh, no, I'm really happy that I get to come on your show, especially because I'm a big fan of Turkey and cycling in Turkey. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. First of all, I would like you to uh, introduce to the people uh, who doesn't know you well. Yeah, you became the fastest woman to circumnavigate the world uh, in 2012. The next year, in uh, 2013, you participated in the transcontinental race as the only woman and the first woman and finished in the ninth place. Uh, next year, you did not stop uh, in 2014. Uh, you participated in the Trans America, won by the women's category, and you finished uh, on the fourth place overall, I guess. Then, three years later, in 2017, you participated in the Indian Pacific Wheel Race uh, in Australia. Uh, we will come to that topic. Uh, this is kind of interesting. Then the next year, uh, you uh, went one of the uh, biking men series in Oman. Uh, you won on the women's category again and uh, finished third on the overall. Now you are directing a race uh, which is called Two Volcano Sprints. Uh, we will go to uh, each of the topics one by one. Uh, as I said earlier, you went to the Sorghum No Gate Tour in 2012. Uh, can you tell us about the tour briefly uh, with the numbers also? Sure, yes. Um, so I set off in 2012 in July um, with the idea of making the first woman's record. Uh, I didn't have any kind of real uh, training before that. I didn't have a background in sport or extreme ultra sport, certainly not in cycling. I had never cycled before. Mm -hmm. And I decided I wanted to cycle the world after the man that I loved very much had died and I was in a very dark place emotionally. So I decided to go on an adventure to... I think I needed to get a, to, to escape. I needed to find a way to escape. So that's what I did. I got on my bike and I escaped. Now I had to, I had to train myself to cycle because I didn't know before that how to cycle. So I, I trained for a few months, uh, every day, just adding a bit more mileage and I set off. Mm -hmm. So I set off without any money or sponsor mm -hmm. and people kind of followed me along the route and I ended up making it around the world. The first woman's record ever. Yeah. Uh, in 152 days total time and 144 days of actual cycling and passing four continents and 19 countries and almost 30,000 kilometers it was yeah. a big adventure <laughs> and that was sort of my introduction into not just the world of cycling but also into ultra cycling so I mean, people were like, you can never, you're never going to make it. You're not a cyclist. You don't know what you're doing. And I, it's true. I didn't know what I was doing. But, you know, by the time I made it around, I was a cyclist. <laughs> <laughs> it was a big escape. Actually. I figured out I was pretty good at riding long distances. <laughs> you trained for the tour in a very short period. Did you have enough time to know your equipment, uh, like your bike, uh, your group set or bag, something like that? No. So, I mean, I really just jumped off the deep end as far as cycling, bicycle, knowledge, everything went. I had no idea what I was doing. I actually changed bikes from a basic touring bike, which was quite heavy, um, to a light road bike like 10 days before I left. And I had never cycled on a road bike before. So <laughs> if you're a cyclist, obviously, you know the difference between, you know, a normal kind of touring bike and a road bike. 
Um, and the reason I did that was because Mike Hall had just set the men's record and I watched his journey very closely and his setup and everything. And he was very lightweight and he had very, very little luggage on his bike. He had a very aerodynamic bag, just one little aerodynamic bag underneath his seat. So I was like, you know what, if I'm going to make any kind of decent mileage in, in a day, which I had to average at least 200 kilometers a day, uh, I thought, well, I, I best sort of follow his his journey and do what he's doing since I know nothing. Um, and so I took, I basically found someone to sponsor me a road bike and I mm -hmm. called it Pegasus yeah. and Pegasus was my trusty steed took me around <laughs> the world. And, uh, and so I, I think I fell. Oh God, I lost count of how many times I <laughs> fell off that bike going around the world, but I didn't know anything. So the most I knew was how to change a tire, uh, a tube. Uh, <laughs> if I, if my, if my tube burst and I got, and I think I had 29 punctures in the entire journey. So I got really good at changing tubes by the end of the, <laughs> by the end of the journey. But the bike itself was so wrong for the trip. I mean, if I would have had to do it again, I would have done everything differently. I would definitely have not taken that bike. It was, it was great. It was lightweight, but it was, everything was in carbon, including the spokes, um, on the bike. And I mean, they just kept snapping off and everything kept breaking. By the end of the trip, I think I had changed every single part on that bike. And the only <laughs> thing that still remained of the original bike was just the frame. I literally had changed everything on that bike. So yeah, I think it was kind of, I just learned as I went. Um, it was mm -hmm. total madness. Yeah. <laughs> so which equipments would you choose today if you do the work tour again? If I were to do it again, I would choose probably more something closer to a Roubaix bike, something that could be both on road and off road, mm. um, closer to a gravel bike, perhaps. Okay. Um, I think I would stick to the road bike steering because it's very comfortable because you can change positions quite, quite a few different positions. So when you're long distancing it, it's very comfortable to be able to do that. Um, and you can go down very aerodynamic on those kind of bikes. Um, but for sure I would do a completely different wheel set. I would do, I had rim brakes. I would definitely, definitely do, um, disc brakes, you know, because all yeah. kind of terrain and weather when it's raining, etc. I mean, you, you want to be able to have a really sturdy bike. So I think the kind of bike I would take would be something closer to what I rode on the Trans Am bike race, uh, which was, it was a Canyon. Um, and it was something like that it was between, between both this closer to a kind of Roubaix bike. Um, and it was great. It was tough as anything. And of course it did break. I break bikes like crazy. I believe <laughs> If I, break can, I break bikes and, break and I bikes. break myself too. I, I, I am, I'm very good at falling. I've, I've, I think it's something of a hobby at this point. I think I've bashed my knees up so many times. The doctors told me like literally, cause <laughs> when I'm in cycling, when I'm training where I live, it's very mountainous, very hilly. And, uh, and I've crashed so many times, but, uh, the last time I went in the, the hospital, the, they were, they just looked at me. They're like, Oh, you again. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then he literally and i think i got the last time i got the stitches i got six stitches in my knee and the the guy was like he said listen this has got to be the last serious fall because you have no skin left to patch up your knees <laughs> i've got like scars over scars over scars and like my skin is so thin and fragile and i have so many scars i was like you don't have any skin left to patch so can you please stop falling <laughs> <laughs> I just got to wear, I don't know, knee patches or something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one day uh, you had a phone call from Michael. He invited you to participate in transcontinental race. Is it your first race? Yeah. So the next year after I came back from the world cycle, um, I was the fastest woman and he was the fastest man. So it seemed ordained that we should finally meet, which we did at a pub in England. I went to see my sisters over the new year, um, the new year of 2012 going into 2013. And I think it was at that meeting that we hung out for the weekend. There was a, a bike show in Bristol, uh, the bespoke bike show. 
And we were both, we had, we hung out together for that weekend. And I think that was when he first told me about his idea that he wanted to make this race across Europe, um, like a crazy unsupported bike race. And he was already trying to recruit me, uh, because he said, Oh, we got to get some women doing it. Uh, at that point there was, well, it was, I think the first kind of main major unsupported bike packing race that kind of was the, the grandfather of all the, the ones that have come out of it since then. So I think it was one of the first. And so he, he always wanted to get women cycling. That was always his goal. Really? And, uh, and he didn't know of any woman who could take on the race. And so he said, Oh, you've got to join the, and I said, I said, but it's a race. I'm not a racer. I've never raced in my life. I don't even know how to cycle. At that point, I still didn't consider myself a cyclist. You know, I was like, I'm not even a cyclist. And he's like, you just cycle around the world. You're a cyclist. I was like, I can cycle now. I said, but I'm not even very good at that. And he was like, listen, you've gone around the world on your bike. You've done, you know, more than 200 kilometers a day. You've, you've, um, you're used to, you know, finding your food and water and, and taking care of yourself. Well, what else do you need? Like, that's what it is. So the original race, the original transcontinental race, it was really just a bunch of kind of explorer type personalities. And we were all just saying, okay, on this date and this time, we're all going to meet on London Bridge and we'll all set off together and we'll see each other for beers in Istanbul. And that was it. Like, that was the, the premise, <laughs> you know? And, you know, well, there'll be a few checkpoints in between where you can, you know, where we'll see the, we'll see my call there. But apart from that, you're on your own, you know, have fun and plan your own route. So it was kind of very much more of an adventure, even than a serious race. Like now racers, oh, they prepare for a year to come and join the Transcontinental and they got their perfect kit and their perfect this. Perfect. I mean, I, at that point, didn't even, I think I didn't have enough bike at that point. Like, cause I had to give back Pegasus to the sponsor who <laughs> gave it to me. So I didn't even have a bike. And, uh, and I certainly didn't have like the right kit or anything like that. I, I think at that point I was still buying, um, uh, men's kit because the women's never, you know, was not good enough. The padding was not, you know, they didn't have good line of women cycling, um, clothes at that time. There was very little for women. So I was actually buying from the men's kit because it was so much better quality. Um, and and I, mean, I was still wearing, you know, my jerseys were from uh, Decathlon. You know, it was very, you know, I was very on a budget kind of cycling. Um, and so I was just, you know, that was the original race. It was really just a bunch of people who didn't even know what they were up to. They didn't know what they were doing. One of the guys, he did his whole route on a paper map. And he was, uh, you know, he got to Istanbul following a paper map. I remember seeing him. We we got to the top of this climb, and I found him sitting there. He was sprawled out in the grass with his bike thrown in the grass, and he had like this huge map out, and he was studying the route. And I was like, "What are you doing?" And he's like, "He's like, I think I'm lost." I'm like, "There's no such thing as lost. There's no route. You can't be lost." And he was like, "That's true." <laughs> it was kind of like, follow the sun. You know, you got to go that direction. So it was very, it was very chill. So I think probably like if, if I had been racing by that point, like serious as I became a serious racer after that, mm -hmm. but at that point it even wasn't serious. So even arriving for me was like, Whoa, I got there. Woohoo. Yeah, it was great. And, um, and, and then, but that was the race when, you know, the, the original sort of group of, of ultra bike packing cyclists sort of so consolidated. Um, themselves and their idea of what they what we wanted to do and what we how we wanted to race um, and Mike wanted it to be kind of how it was in the original before the Tour de France became what it is now it was really you know they used to stick whiskey in their water bottles and you know they, you know, they were basically, and, and I was actually like that on the top of Stelvio. I remember we, as I was climbing up Stelvio, there was a huge storm. It was a massive storm. And Mike was waiting halfway with a, with a camera guy in the car and he caught me coming up. And he had told me at the beginning, he told me, I think, I think I said to him something about it, something being difficult. And he was like, well, you don't get called a badass for nothing. You know, you've got to earn it. So I was going up this, the climb on the Stelvio mountain. I think it's one of the longest, um, climbs in Europe. One of the tallest sort of mountain passes over the, the Alps. And he, and he was waiting there. And as I got closer to the top, there was snow, there was wind, there was rain. It was freezing. And we, we had gone from the bottom being like 30 degrees. 
and the top being zero degrees and like ice storm. And the wind was so strong. I was literally afraid it was going to blow me off the mountain. And he was sitting there like with this huge grin, this happy, wicked grin, watching us suffer as we went up. And I remember shouting, and I was like, is this badass enough for you, Mike? He was like, yeah, <laughs> thumbs up. <laughs> um, but so we got to the top and I went inside one of the restaurants and then there was a, two other riders had got in around the same time. So we we're all eating a big plate of pasta. We we're getting warm. We we're all freezing and sort of building up our courage for the descent because we knew the descent was going to even be worse than the climb because it was yeah. so cold and that wind and that rain and that you know going down and i had still a bike with with rim brakes you know and it was wet and it was oh it was scary so we're out eating and then i was like okay the only way i'm gonna get down that mountain is to get some really nice warm something going on in my core and i had learned from the world cycle when i came back into italy um i came back in december cycling through North Italy, there was suddenly a huge temperature drop and a big storm and it snowed all over the north of Italy. And I had just come from, you know, much warmer weather and I wasn't prepared. I didn't have the right clothes, the right kit for such cold temperatures. And I was freezing. And that's when I got a really bad frostbite on my on my toes. And, and really? I still to this day have a problem with frostbite on my toes. So I can't go to extreme weathers um, without them like blowing up again full of... Um, Full of blisters so I um I the only way I got through that was going from like bar hopping every 50 kilometers or so whenever I saw a bar I would stop and run inside and order a whiskey and like take a shot and I <laughs> and I went through the whole of of north north Italy all the freezing weather like on whiskey I was like Shh. and the bartenders were great Italian bartenders they don't measure the shots you know you ask for a shot and you'll probably get like about three shots worth. Like they're just like boom, 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 <laughs> fill up the cup. They, 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 don't, they don't measure. They just, just go for it. And they were so, they're so impressed. If a cyclist asks for a whiskey and a woman asks for a whiskey on top of it, they're just so excited about it. They think it's the best thing ever. So they'll just fill the glass right up to the top. So, so when I got up to the top of the Stelvio, I was like, I think I can get to the bottom if I have a nice warm core, right? So I went to the bar and I ordered uh, a shot of two shots of whiskey, which meant a mm -hmm. completely full glass. And then I asked for the la the day before his newspaper. So I stuck the whole newspaper down the front of my shirt yeah. and I stuffed it into my gloves. And uh, and then I put like every piece of jacket and clothing on that I had. And mind you, it was the middle of summer, so it was so hot. I mean, we got to Serbia, it was 40 degrees, but up in the mountain, it was zero degrees. Like, who was prepared for that? No one. So, yeah, you know, I just stuffed newspaper in every part of my body I could get it in. And then I knocked back the whiskey, and I headed out into that storm. And it took probably about the same amount of time as it took to climb. It took the same amount to descend, just because I couldn't go fast. There's no guardrail. The wind was super strong. And those brakes were like slipping. Uh, they were just sliding all over the place. I was just like, oh, God, I'm going to die. But yeah, anyway, that was fun. The, the, the tr first transcontinental race for me was, I mean, I think the, the inaugural of all these races, I always look for the inaugural races because they have something super authentic about them in the beginning. And the kind of people that participate, um, you know, they just tend to be there to have a really good ride. And, you know, it's not about the competition as much as it's the experience and having fun. So that first race for me was probably the most fun I ever had on any race. And and all of us, like Christoph um, Aldegard, that's when he sort of first made his name as super strong cyclist. Uh, but that first race, I mean, I remember Al I remember meeting Christoph. That <laughs> we became good friends after that race. But um, we all got to the briefing on the beginning day. Um, the day, sorry, the day before the race, there was the rider briefing and we all met in, um, look, mom, no hands. It's like a bike shop slash cafe. And Mike was there to give us, you know, the basic, the route, the briefing where we needed to go for, um, um, the checkpoints, etc. And, um, we were all sitting there all having beer because, you know, we, nobody was very serious about it. We're all, no, we were serious about it, but we were, you know, we were all there to have a good time. We're all drinking beer. Yeah. I remember I, when I walked in, Christoph was, I think, probably the first one there. And he was sitting at this table. And he had this bottle of water between his hands. And he was like this. <laughs> completely deadpan face. And I was like, I looked at him and was like, 
whoa, that guy is serious. <laughs> I think he's a serious writer. <laughs> and uh, from the beginning of the race on, like I saw him the, when we first set off, he went, shoom, and that was it. I never saw him again to the end. <laughs> But, but then, so I was like, oh my God, the guy is like, I thought he was a type A personality, you know, super uh, anal and like, but I got to the end and he was there waiting with beer at the finish line as we do. And, uh, and he was hysterical. Like he did not stop talking. He was just constantly talking and oh my God, we laughed so much. And the guy was hilarious. I mean, we, I remember at some point, because we, we started we were drinking once we all got there, we were all drinking to the end of the day. And we all jumped inside this taxi. And I think there was like way more people in that taxi than was legal. And there was this taxi driver. He had these like disco lights going on in his taxi. This is in Istanbul. And he was like blasting this kind of, um, what was it? It was like house music. And he was like dancing while he was driving and we were swerving all like that and we were like oh my god we're all gonna die but we we're laughing so hard it was just the funniest time and Chris, i think i was sitting on christoph's lap yeah i was because we couldn't all fit in the taxi i was sitting on his lap oh we were laughing and staring like so much my stomach was hurting oh my god um and so then and then you christoph was one of those types that once he started talking he does not stop talking and by the point we were all like christoph shut up <laughs> So like he went from yeah a complete robot like we called him the Terminator the Belgian Terminator he went from being the Terminator to being like a total clown comedian it was hilarious yeah so that's what I got to know for Christoph through for that first race but yeah it was such a good race the first one was the best for sure okay what was the difference between a uh, bike picking yourself and racing between bike packing and racing. Yes. Um, well, the major difference is that when you're bike packing, obviously, I like, I love the, I love being able to just jump on a bike with minimal belongings and just go and have, you know, I don't know where I'm going to end up. I don't know where I'm sleeping at night, and just have an adventure. And that's the beauty of bike packing, you know. And because you're quite light, you can really, you can do a lot of mileage. You can see a lot in a day. Um, while still being right inside of your environment and, you know, being present inside of every place you pass and, you know, a great way to meet people. So curious where you're going, where you came from. So like bikepacking for me is a great way just to travel in general. But the difference between bikepacking and bikepacking in a race is in a race puts you into automatically into a format that you would never willingly put yourself into. Um, you're forced, well, not, you're not forced, but because every, it's a race, you, you will do a lot. You will push yourself much further than you ever would yeah. otherwise. And, you know, mentally you cannot go in that place unless you're in that race format. You can't push yourself as far as you do when you're in a bikepacking race. You know, you, you, um, you're able to suffer more. You're able to endure a lot more. And, uh, and so I think that's the major difference is that it pushes you further than you would ever push yourself outside of that sort of race format, I think. And I think that's, that's what makes the difference. Uh, while actually you're pushing your limits, one of the hardest thing is actually, uh, the, The, the move you you gotta move you shouldn't sleep or yeah you shouldn't stop um so do you have goals to have a break or sleep actually how do you uh handle uh, or do you rest whenever you need um yeah that i mean that's something that i think you kind of learn as you go on and i think mm -hmm. in the like for example in the first race i did in the transcontinental i think i slept quite a lot more than I ever did in any other race. And that was just because I didn't actually know the race format. And it was the first race. Like we were all just learning as we went. Um, but I realized actually I could sleep a lot less and still be fine. So as, as I went on, I started sleeping less and less and I started being better at managing my time in general. So managing when I stopped for how long I stopped and being quicker about it, you know, it's like, um, be more organized. So when I stop, I do, fill my water bottles, go to the bathroom, you know, 
wash my shorts, do everything mm-hmm. in one, you know, and I have a time limit to do that in. And mm-hmm. I think that's something that you kind of learn with time. So the first, obviously, the first race, the transcontinental, I did an average of 300 kilometers a day, which for me was a lot because I had never done such a thing before. I mean, mm-hmm. when I did the world cycle, I was averaging 200. And uh, and I think the most I ever did in a day was 280 kilometers. So for me, doing an average of 300 was I it kind of opened my eyes it's like wow I'm actually able to do this physically and I wonder how many more kilometers I'm able to do and obviously that's in balance with how much you stop how much you sleep how much you know you take the time and so I think the more you get into racing then the more you become good at um, being fast about everything you do about how fast you eat how fast you know or you don't stop to eat, you just eat on the bike. Yeah. Um, but the, the for me, the most difficult part of racing is sleep deprivation because unlike some racers like Christoph, like <laughs> there are a few I know, they don't they don't need sleep. Like they they go very right. fine without sleep. For me, I mean, I was it's so difficult not to do more than two three hours of sleep a night. To do less than that, it's it's really difficult for me to maintain a good pace because I get more and more mm-hmm. tired. So um, the, the the transcontinental race, I think I could have done it a lot faster than I did, but I did it, you know, it, for me, it was my first experience. It was kind of like a trial, uh, trial, trial and error. I was learning as I went. Um, and I think from that, I really did start to understand that, okay, so now I can, I know I can sleep less. I think at that race, I was sleeping like five hours a night, which is, you know, quite, quite a lot for one of these races. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I was like, well, I can do better. I can sleep less. I can go further. I don't need to stop and have, you know, a big meal in a restaurant, which consumes time. So I, I started to, I think I learned from that how to manage better, which is probably what helped me when I went over to the, the next year's race in the Trans Am, um, when I was much better at that. I was, I slept a lot less. I think I slept three hours a night instead, um, because that's a long race. You can't go without yeah. one hour sleep a night over three weeks. You can't do that. So, <laughs> um, it, it also, ma- you know, it depends on the format and how long the race is, is as to how many hours you need to sleep. So, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. That, that really depends. Um, so you get a lot of experiences in transcontinental race, then yeah. you decided to participate in the Trans America race. Uh, yeah. Can you tell us about the Trans America? Mm. I mean, that was a crazy race. That race, <clears throat> I I had already started to understand the the body mind correspondence with you know if you can push yourself if your mind um, your mind is in control and your body kind of follows and I understood that mm-hmm. because I didn't ever think that I could do you know over a certain period of time three hundred kilometers a day every single day without stopping um, I was like well if I can do that I wonder how much further I can go how much more I can do. Uh, so the Trans Am race was the race that brought home to me how much the mind does control the body. Um, and from day one, no, from day two, everything went wrong on that race. I mean, I how I got to the end is already a miracle. <laughs> um, day two, I had a really bad crash and um, and ended up, well, I was knocked out. And, you know, I hit my head really hard and I completely, like, lost consciousness and then I was in a shock and everything else but then I decided oh if you're fine I'm gonna keep going I bashed my knee and my bike was all bashed up but I was like oh you know it works I keep going (laughs) so um (laughs) but but on that crash I broke a rib so I basically did the whole trans um, bike race on a on a cracked rib which is hugely painful I mean so I from that I was taking um, ibuprofen and painkillers the entire race mm-hmm. to just be able to like be able to breathe because just mm-hmm. to breathe hurts so bad and it's your lungs expand and it pushes your rib cage so um, and we were just doing mountains and mountains and very high mountains with you know high altitudes so I don't know I wasn't used to that either so uh, it was like so many challenges in that race and then halfway through um, my seat post broke well no rather the the screw wore down and i mm-hmm. couldn't lift it so the seat post was kept going down but the screw would had been completely consumed 
and it was a unique screw because Canyon is a German brand and they don't have very many <laughs> shops that sell those parts. So unfortunately, <laughs> they're unique parts. So no shop had yeah. a way to not only take out the screw, but to replace it. And unfortunately, um, so I was duct taping the seat post. I was trying to like keep it up with like tons and tons and tons of duct tape, um, which is... I mean, no cyclist should ever cycle without duct tape. <laughs> but obviously, it kept going down. So I rode the second half of the race with my seat post way, way down low and my knees way up high. And that sort of was one of the worst things that could have ever happened. Not that I knew at the time. I didn't know that I was destroying my knees, but I was. And, um, and so I got to the end of that race... Uh, my knees were blown up like this big and I was basically surviving on painkillers to keep being able to, to pedal. And, uh, and then I did the last 800 kilometers nonstop. Um, mm -hmm. so I think it was 36 hours that I didn't sleep. And that was the first for me that I'd ever done such a thing, you know? And so for me, it was quite interesting to, to see, I was, I was, um, because I had sat so long in such a bad position, uh, without stopping, I got a really bad pinched nerve that ran all the way from my, my knee all the way up my back. It was so bad. I was crying. It was the last hundred kilometers. I was pedaling with one foot. I couldn't, I couldn't even pedal. I was in so much pain. And, um, and there was, a um, the guy who was tied with me were both like this for the last two days, mm -hmm. uh, both wanting to get into fourth place. Um, and at, before that point, like, I had not care. But once I got to a certain point, uh, I was eating up the front. And suddenly, like, I got tons of people, like, going crazy across America. Like, we had so much support. There were so many dot watchers who were um, waiting by the side of the road for us with big signs and, like, giving us, like, you know, food and water. And they're just so happy to see us. And, uh, and as I started to get closer and closer to the front, it became like this huge deal. Everyone was like, wait, what? There's a woman who's like beating the men. <laughs> and because it, because it was such a unique, um, it was in the early stages of the sport. Firstly, there were almost no women doing it. And the fact yeah. that no one believed women could do it because there was no one doing it. So mm -hmm. there was still this misconception that women are weaker I had only been cycling for three years. How is it possible that she's only cycled, no, two and a half years. She's only cycled two and a half years and she's at the front of the pack. Like there, she must be cheating. And I got all kinds of, I got a, tons of support from women. And then I got a whole bunch of accusations from, you know, men going, oh, no, I mean, she must be doing something. She must be doping. She must uh, have a camper man following her, like all kinds of nonsense. And, uh, and that kind of actually gave me a kick in the butt. And I was like, well, fuck you. <laughs> like, you think I can't do it? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to show you exactly what I can do. So actually that put like a fire under my bum and I just went for it. And after that, like the more accusations I got, the more I was quite determined to, to keep going further. So I, by the time I got to that point, the last two days, I was neck and neck with this other guy who was doing professional racing. So he was, he was strong. And uh, and he was determined that he shouldn't be beat by a woman, right? So we kept meeting <laughs> each other on the road and like passing each other, and one would pass the other, and one would pass the other. But we got to the very last two hundred kilometers, and we were basically cycling at the same pace. And so we're like, fine, we're gonna cycle through the night. We both know neither of us are gonna stop because we don't want to give the other the position. So the whole night we didn't sleep. And so we were both of us on the bike hallucinating. We were both like <laughs> falling asleep on the bike. I mean, I fell asleep on the bike and I almost went into a truck because I went into the other lane and I heard this like horn going, Burr! and I was like, woke up and this headlights of a truck coming. I was like, ah! and I quickly <laughs> swerved. So because of, because of that, we like, and he had said twice, he had just literally fallen over on his bike because he had just like fallen over sleeping on his bike. So between the two of us, we're like, okay, we're going to keep each other uh, from dying. So <laughs> we didn't cycle next to each other, but we cycled close enough that we kept shouting at each other through the night. So I would shout, are you okay? And he's like, yes. I was like, you awake? Yes. So, you know, we, we kept the last night, we kept each other company and we got to the dawn. And, uh, and at that point, my, my 
bum was so in so much pain. I was I was crying on the bike. I thought that I wouldn't make it. I didn't know how I was going to make it. And the dawn was coming up. And um, and I got a text from Mike from Mike Hall because mm-hmm. he had he had arrived two days before I think two or three days before and he was waiting at the finish, and he said the last twenty kilometers are all cobblestones. No. He's like, so I suggest letting some air out of your tires to make it comfier. And I was like, no, no, no. With already in so much pain, like that kind of shock on the on my back, I was like, oh god, I'm gonna die. Uh, but obviously I didn't need to let air out of my tires because I hadn't blown up my tires for quite a few days. <laughs> the air was already out. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so Jesse, ha- Jesse was the guy I was going neck and neck with. He had his family, family waiting at the end. And, uh, and so he was super excited. He was like, he said to me, I, I was done. We get, we have light, you know, we're awake again. And he's like, I'm going to go for it. I'm just going to go for it. I was like, you know what? You got this man, take fourth, I'll take fifth, no problem, gentleman's agreement. I have nothing to prove at this point. Like, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm so happy as far as I've gotten. Like, I never thought I would get this, this far, this close to the front. So, you know, for all the difficulties I went through, I'm very happy with my, my ride. Um, and so he went, he went charging into the horizon and I just saw this like little black shadow dot like into the sun and gone. And I was like, there was something in me that just couldn't let it go. <laughs> after all I had suffered, like after everything, I was so close. And I just, uh, I got this amazing shot of adrenaline. And my brain could not let it go. And my body was done. I was so quick. I was finished. And I was just like, no, no, no. And I went and I went and I chased him. And I went, room, and he literally, I think, I remember it was the last five kilometers, he looked, he was like, dude, like charging, I think he was doing something like 40 kilometers an hour, like, Woo! and he looked behind, and I was right on his tail, and he was like, <laughs> <laughs> his face, he couldn't believe it, because he was sure I was gone, because he knew, he saw me crying during the night with my, uh, you know, my bum all, you know, mm-hmm. pinched nerve and all the rest. No, he couldn't believe it. Um, and, and we literally rolled into the finish line together, neck and neck. So we tied fourth place and I was just like, yeah. And then I collapsed on the grass and I didn't know anything for it. <laughs> and I remember I you woke up that. because the, I had these two Italians, this pair of Italians chasing me the entire time because they were some of the ones making the accusations. They didn't believe that a woman was, you know, being able to, to, uh, ride so strong. They, they had been mm-hmm. cycling their entire lives. And there's like this, this chick, two years, two years cyclist, and she's a beating us. They're like, no way. So they were giving all these online, all these accusations. And then when they said that, I was like, you know what? This is the last time you're ever going to see me on the road, eat my dust. And I went for it and they never saw me again <laughs> after that. So I, I woke up because I, someone was saying, Oh, the Italians are coming. And I jumped up and I was like, on a ground where's my bike and I thought I was still in the race I was completely out of my brain I just so <laughs> tired it's, I had done you know 800 kilometers without stopping um and then Mike was like no no you, you've arrived you're here and I was like oh, oh thank god and I think we all went for like three breakfasts so it was but anyway so but, but that was still you know the early days we still had a really nice crowd it was of you know uh and Mike was Mike was probably one of my biggest inspirations as far as pushing me further and further. I think that race, that's what he told me. He said, the starting line, he said to me, just don't ever stop. And so I, that's what I took his, you know, and that's what I was like, okay, I don't stop. I go, I, I don't stop and take a nice meal. I just grab something and I ride. So like, he gave me the first like really valuable advice. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, no, it was, it was a really interesting race. But from that race, I kind of understood the mind-body correlation where if if your body should have quit ages ago, but your mind is not ready to quit, you can go at least 20% further than you thought you could. Um, and that's what that showed me. Because, I mean, like, as soon as I finished the race, I could hardly walk. Actually, they had to wheelchair me onto the plane because my ankles and my knees were so swollen I couldn't actually walk. <laughs> 
So I, I, as soon as I got off my bike, like my body collapsed completely. <laughs> but as long as I was in that race, my brain was like, "No, you're going," and that was, and I stayed on that bike. You know, I think I somehow knew if I stopped, I would never get back on the bike again. So that's why I did that sort of eight hundred non-stops. So I was like, I just have to stay on the bike, and I'll get to the end. As soon as I, if I get off the bike, I'm never gonna finish. So, yeah. Okay. So, uh, how do you prepare for the races? And do you follow a training plan? Um, so I I became my own guinea pig in the sense that I never. First of all, there were no trainers out there who had trained women for these kind of events, doing these kind of distances, and nobody actually knew what what was possible and what we we're capable of. So when I did the world cycle, um, I. After I had gotten to war, where I could cycle 120 kilometers without stopping, mm -hmm. um, I found a trainer who uh, took me on and gave me like a training plan to try and build my muscles, etc. Because I I was not an athlete, I was not a cyclist, so I needed to get more strength in my legs and my core, etc. Um, but that was the extent of my training as far as having a professional trainer went. Uh, so then I kind of became self-experimental that I thought, well, now I need to figure out how my body works and um, from that make a training plan as to what I'm going to do to improve myself. And uh, I changed over many things. I changed my diet. So I went mm -hmm. keto uh, really? because I realized, yeah, I realized that in these long distance races, um, if you don't need to stop as much to keep Um, eating and mm -hmm. you know stocking up on food and liquids you can go much further and already women's bodies are very well adapted to um, slow fat burning because mm -hmm. we already have great reserves of fat that the men don't so we are already very good at maintaining um, our our calories and you know I think women probably stop half as much as the men in these races um, so I thought I learned that not only for being able to stop less um, and never bonking, because if you're on a carb diet, you bonk very quickly if you don't, mm -hmm. you know, keep fueling that that yeah. um, that sugar depletion, that glucose mm -hmm. depletion. But if you don't have that, even if you don't find a place that has food and you can't restock and you can't eat, you can keep going at a very nice pace without bonking and without collapsing. Because yeah. once sure. you bonk, you're done. Your game's over. You can take a day mm -hmm. to recover. It's very hard. So I don't have to learn not to bonk, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm the guy who always consumes carbs and sugar. Constantly on the, yeah, on the bike. Which, I mean, it's fine in, in, in a one-day thing, but on a like, multi-day, you don't actually know where you might get your next food stop. I mean, it can be a game-changer, a huge game-changer. Um, and then not only that, but it was, it's also an anti-inflammatory diet. So after the Trans Am, I found out that I... And I found out the hard way, because I, I signed up for the Transcontinental in 2015. And I did, a, I did 900 kilometers in, you know two days and then my knees completely collapsed and I found out from then that from the Trans Am race I had destroyed my knees very mm -hmm. very badly mm -hmm. and I had to do all kinds of therapy to try and get them back and to, to, to this day I still have really serious knee problems um, I've consumed all my cartilage I've really destroyed very, very badly damaged my knees Uh, from the transcon so unfortunately it's one of those parts of your body that you can't recover once it's destroyed and you can only find a way to manage it um so i found out that at least my knees would get less inflamed and oh because i was taking so many um ibuprofen for managing the pain and the inflammation during the trans am i also mm -hmm. developed uh, i also developed an allergy to Um, anti-inflammatories so I, <laughs> I can no so longer so you damaged but you can't use the pills <laughs> yeah so I cannot take anti-inflammatories when my knees mm -hmm. blow up in a race I'm that's it the game is over uh, so unfortunately yes your mind can take your body quite a bit further than you ever thought but then at the same time 
once you break the machine, you're going to pay for the damages. So you've got to find the balance between the two because your mind is stronger than your body, but then you can destroy your body because your mind is stronger and your body can't take what your mind can. So you really have to find that. It's a very fine balance, and I've only learned it through hard experience and unfortunately bad experience that has destroyed some aspects of racing for me. But in any case... Um, because I was on an anti-inflammatory diet, which is a ketogenic diet, I was able to also keep the, you know, my knees and the swelling down through, uh, through that kind of a diet. So I, mm -hmm. I basically went that way for a, a few different reasons, but it made a huge difference in my racing and in, in general. Um, and so that was one of the big changes that I went over to in 2015. And, you know, I took the next couple of years to kind of build up my strength and try and fix my knees and change over my body system, my diet and all the rest uh, to something that would work better. I have additional question about the, the training part. Do you or have you ever used a power meter or do you just train by the feeling or heart rates? I did do a training in power meter in 2015. Mm -hmm. Um, because I got a guy who was, he was, he wanted to, he's a trainer and he advised, well, he suggested to me to try it, to, you know, to figure out how my body works. Mm -hmm. So I did it for a year so that I would understand my own body. And, um, I followed it religiously for a year, all the watts and all the rest. And mm -hmm. then... After that year, I once I sort of understood myself, I stopped because I found it took the joy out of cycling for me. Completely killed the pleasure of it. I mean, because I was so just absorbed with, you know, the, you know, the power, the wattage, all the rest yeah. that I just... Um, it For me, I understood that I think I do these things for my these races, these bikepacking uh, challenges. I do it for myself more than anything mm -hmm. else. And it's, it's not to, because you're not getting it, you're not getting money for it. You're not getting anything from it. You're getting it only what you get out of it yourself. And, uh, and I knew I was never going to make a career out of it because, you, you know, it's one of those, it's that kind of world we don't, you know, you can't. It's just not monetary. It doesn't pay. Uh, so I understood that I wanted to understand my body, but I, once I did, it I, I stopped because it took the pleasure out of um, out of cycling. I, I no longer was watching the road and watch. So now when I train, I definitely train according to heart rate mm -hmm. and um, and time. So okay. because because I because of the area where I train, I trained with the um, power meter. I know what my, when my heart rate goes a certain way, I know uh, my breathing and I know my timing for certain things. So then I know what is my max, what isn't. So I'm pretty much, I've figured out my, my own body. So I don't need it. And I know when I'm training, what I'm doing as far as, you know, my, my powers goes, but uh, because of the time and everything else. But yeah, uh, honestly, I wouldn't choose to, to train with the power meter anymore. <laughs> if I don't have to, I wouldn't. It's a great training tool, but I, it, I just it takes the joy out of it for me. Christoph said the same things with the power meter. Mm, did he? Interesting. So he agrees. Yeah. Uh, I want to talk about uh, Indian Pacific Wheel Race. Uh, it mm -hmm. was a very long race in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> we were... Everywhere is desert, desert. Uh, how did you manage the nutrition? Because uh, one of our guests uh, wrote in the Australia, he said to us, uh, distance between markets are 100, 200 kilometers. Well, first of all, on a ketogenic diet, you don't need to eat for 200 kilometers. <laughs> We all gonna start ketogenic Which diet after this show. Which is what I did. I didn't have to eat for 200. Between roadhouses, I didn't have to eat. I was perfectly fine. I will eat on a race. I could eat just twice a day. That's it. Really? Twice a day. Yeah. Twice a day. What is your uh, meals? Uh... Full of fat and protein. Fat and protein. Okay. Yeah. So when I was honestly, though, when you're when you're in the middle of nowhere, you don't get a huge choice as to what you can eat. You eat what you find. Mm -hmm. But 
you can sort of when you get to that point when you're on a when you're a ketogenic and your body knows how to burn efficiently burn sure mm-hmm. whatever you put into it because at that stage you're consuming like fourteen thousand calories a day so it doesn't matter what you put in your body it's gonna burn like crazy yeah so at sure. that point you eat what you find but when your body is is adapted to that towards eating like that um ketogenic it's it is more efficient in the way it burns it basically so whatever you put in it's going to efficiently burn uh so that's the main plus and so i mean in the roadhouses i would always look for for any kind of protein that i could eat as much as it much as possible and i would you like literally just take cubes of butter and just eat them really yeah and i and i took with me uh um MCT oil, which is a kind of condensed coconut oil, and mm-hmm. I was carrying those on the races, and I would just take a shot of that. I was just drinking oil like a car, <laughs> just drinking oil, <laughs> and that gave me tons of energy. Like so, I could just do that, and I would always stock up on tons of like different nuts, yeah. nuts, cheeses, dry fruits, that kind of stuff that's got high calorie, and you can eat just a little bit, and 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 you know your body will will use it over a long period of time. So. This, you know, it was quite easy to do. Um, but the, the road, how the problem with Australia in general, but specifically going across the Nullarbor desert is that it's very, um, I don't want to call it highway robbery, but I suppose because it's so isolated, the prices in Australia are already high, like crazy. Yeah. yeah. So expensive Australia, but because they're in the middle of nowhere, to get the supplies, I assume, out there costs a lot. And therefore, mm-hmm. the, the prices of everything is three times as much as it would be in a, a you know any city. So, you know, even a bottle of water can be $10 yeah. for a bottle of that. water. You know what I mean? Like, it's so expensive. You're right. So you it's need a robbery. To eat, you, it really is a robbery. But, I mean, and that's just the water. So, imagine the food. <laughs> you yeah. you just oh no, it's ridiculous. And for a cyclist, starving cyclist, it's really not fun. You, you <laughs> you're not you can't be on a budget. You need to, you literally need to have money to be able to eat. So, uh, and that's why ketogenic diet is helpful because then you can actually <laughs> eat less. Because if you have to constantly eat and the prices are that high, you are so B keto B budget. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's very good for the budget. So anyway. Um, that helped me a lot in that, in that race. Um, but so the India Pacific wheel race, I suppose, cause I had already done that entire, well, I'd done Australia doing the world cycle and I'd gone across the little bird and everything. I already knew what to expect. So for me, it wasn't, uh, you know, I think something that once you know, a, an area or you've done it before mentally, it's easier. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, but at the same time, I think partially I did it because Mike was also going to join and it was the inaugural event. And, I, you know, I love inaugural events. And Mike himself as well had not enjoyed his experience across Australia. He had very much the same experience as me, which was really bad drivers. Um, it wasn't the most enjoyable country to cycle across, honestly. And the terrain is the same thing for thousands of kilometers doesn't change so you really feel like you're on a treadmill you know you don't have a great Mm -hmm. change of scenery it's not very interesting as far as uh, landscape and it goes but i knew it so for me it was familiar so it was you know i thought it'd be you know it could be fun let's see and christoph was going like it was my it was christoph was all the old crowd i was like oh (laughs) this could be like you know the early days and this should be fun again we're all gonna go across australia together exploring blah 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 so I mean, but something else inside of me told me I had to I had to do this race, and I don't know why because I had this anxiety, really bad anxiety going to this race, um, and I couldn't explain it. My partner noticed it too because he never seen me so agitated and so tense, so nervous, and he was like, "You know, you don't have to do this race," and I said, "No, I really I have to. I do. I have to," and I don't know why I had to say I had to do it. And from the get go, for me, it was just like a, it was an unlucky race from the beginning. I mean, I got into the Nullarbor, um, and my knees started to swell up. And as I told you, I can't take anti inflammatories, but I can take mm-hmm. painkillers like aspirin and that kind of family, uh, 
tachypurina. So I had the painkiller that my um, that uh, a doctor had told me. Oh, this is you know this is a good painkiller if your knees start to blow up. So I was taking this, and I found out after, as things went, um, that it was the same family as ibuprofen, but I didn't know this. The same ingredient, but like five times stronger. <laughs> so really? basically, I was. So I I got halfway through the Nolabur Desert and suffered a basically a heart attack. Um, <laughs> because as a, as a, because of you this, were allergic to the because I was allergic to also this. yeah exactly and uh, and my, my my entire face and my entire body like blew up like a balloon and uh, and my heart was going 180 uh, beats per minute and uh, I couldn't breathe my lungs were like <gasps> And I was like 30 kilometers from a roadhouse and I don't know how, but somehow I got to the roadhouse and mm-hmm. I got inside and like I walked in and the guy behind the counter ran out from behind the counter and he put a chair under me and like he saw I was like, don't death store. <laughs> you were dying. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and he was like, he said, what happened to you? I was like, oh, fine. I'm fine. I just need to sit down. <laughs> I probably need to eat something. And he was like, no, you need to sleep. And I was like, no, no, I'm in a race. I'm not sleeping. He was like, no, you need to sleep. And so like, he put me in one of the rooms and put me in a bed. And I mm-hmm. woke up in the, in the next morning and I was even worse. I, I was, my whole face, I, my eyes were, my, my face was so puffy I couldn't open my eyes. They were just like slits. And, uh, and he said, you know, you're suffering clearly a, a, some kind of a reaction and so he got the bush doctor on the phone and the bush doctor, they took a photo of me and they sent all of my symptoms and they sent the, the painkiller that I've been taking for my knees. And the doctor mm-hmm. was like, yeah, she's suffering an allergic reaction. So they told them what to give me to, so they had a, a medical kit and everything to give me the medicine to bring the swelling down and to like bring my heart rate down because it was super high. And, um, and so then I hitched a ride back with some truckers mm-hmm. back to, um, to Perth, the starting line, and went to see a doctor and uh, basically got myself better. And that was like for five days, I stayed in Perth. And then I decided, look, I came all this way, so I'm going to restart and I'm going to do it as a time trial since the race is already, you know, gone. Mm-hmm. I'm going to I'm gonna still race it. I'm going to race the clock and I'm going to race, do the race route as a time trial. So I set off again and I was great. I mean, I was flying. I think I was averaging 500 kilometers a day. Yeah. And then I got back into the, into the desert and like I had a slow, so bleed. So my tires, my, basically my, the, the rim lining of the inside of my wheel Mm -hmm. kept breaking the, the, uh, the tube. Uh, mm-hmm. rim so I kept slow bleeding I kept losing tires till I had none left and I was in the middle of the desert and I couldn't fix it my patches weren't working because when it's when it's where the valve is you can't fix it you know mm-hmm. so I stuffed towels into my wheel <laughs> and serious. was riding across the desert on this like stuffed with like and it was like boom 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 it felt like I was riding on like lumps like boom 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 boom, boom. And mm-hmm. I was going across the desert on this thing <laughs> it was amazing and you wouldn't believe what happened but so I posted on Facebook going you know until I get to the next city or town where I can find a tube this is like this is my <laughs> ride and my bum was destroyed obviously because I was just like hitting the you know the bumps yeah. every um and then these truckers who had picked me up going back to Perth when I was sick that I had hitchhiked with, they were following me on Facebook and they saw that I had run out of tubes, right? And they, they saw me tubes. like riding. And they were going back along the same route. And I like, it was early morning. I was riding along. All of a sudden I hear this like, Burr! and this huge train truck pulls off the road. And they've got this big plastic bag, like full of tubes for me. Like, <laughs> that was amazing. But uh, no, I mean, we had, I had found so much great camaraderie on that road. The people were so nice. But uh, so I got new tubes. I was going along. And then the next morning is when I got the, got the news that Mike had been killed. So basically he had um, been hit in the back mm-hmm. um, by a hit. And I think the driver was, oh, who knows, but he, he didn't even have a license. Um and yeah, he was hit and killed. And it was weird because I, I didn't believe it. You know, at the time, I, 
I thought it was, I think the shock, it's one of those things you think it's going to be anyone but him. Why Mm -hmm. he was the most careful of everybody. He had, you know, he's the most lit up. He had his own race and he made sure everybody was, you know, well lit up, wearing reflective vests, tons of light. So it wasn't that he wasn't seen, but, um, I just didn't believe it. And I just kept cycling for another half an hour. And then all of a sudden it, Finally, it hit me, and I, I just stopped in the in the first town I came on, and I just something went out of me, like the heart went out of my legs. I just couldn't, I just couldn't continue. I just like, you know, uh, I had started racing with Mike, and for me, it just like I once he had, when once it was his end, you know, he was never gonna race again. The finality of that um, hit me just so hard, and. Uh, and that was it. I, that was the, you know, the race was over. <laughs> you know, and most of us tried to get back to Sydney because they were, they said they were going to do a memorial ride for him that Sunday. It was Friday and I hitchhiked uh, to Adelaide to catch a flight to try and get to his memorial ride on Sunday. Yeah, I'm very sorry for the mic. Uh, he's the uh, father of the modern r- bike racing. Yeah, uh, yes. He, he needs, he needs respect. Uh, mm. Can you tell us about Biking Man Oman briefly? Yeah. Um, so after Mike died, uh, I think something in my in my brain kind of switched off. I just I couldn't bring myself to go back into racing. I felt like like my racing time was done because I you know. I don't know, something mental, and I, and I don't know if it's the same, but I've noticed with all of the old crowd who were there with Mike from the beginning, we've all kind of stepped away from racing since then, um, and maybe it has something psychologically for us, Mike, it finished with Mike, and uh, and we, we kind of understood it was the end of an era, and it would never come back to the way it was, and with Mike gone, You know, things will move on, but it will never be as it was. And I think that, that sort of knowing that mentally has been... Has yeah, been Christoph also stopped racing after yeah. my, like... Yeah. He was thinking like you, actually. Yeah. And uh, and I know the difference. I mean, so when he when Mike died, I, you know, I was one of the ones who helped to continue the Transcontinental. I was managing it for the first two years with a group of other people. Mm-hmm. Um, but even then I've understood that even the transcontinental race is no longer Mike's race. It's becoming its own beast, but it's something different. And the kind of people racing necessarily aren't, I don't know. Everything has changed in the feeling of the, this sort of race, these kind of, um, bikepacking races. So, um, I, when I, when I heard about the Oman sprint, I had wanted to do a big ride in the Middle East because when I did the world cycle, I had skipped over the Middle East and gone directly from India to Turkey because mm-hmm. um, I wasn't allowed to pass through uh, certain countries en route because I was yeah. alo- I was alone as a woman mm-hmm. and I needed um, mm-hmm. I couldn't find anyone who could come with me, so I didn't you know, and I wanted to be anyway alone. So, for the record. Um, And so I, I was on my bucket list. So I, I started to, you know, go back into long distance cycling, but for the pleasure of it. And on my bucket list was doing, you know, a few countries in the Middle East that I wanted to do. And so when that came up on the radar for me, I thought, you know, this would be an interesting opportunity to see a country around that area that I haven't been to and have the route, like an amazing route already planned that You know, so I, I know exactly what I, where I got to go, but I get to see the best of the country. So I kind yeah. of, I kind of went into it just for myself. I just thought, you know what, I'm just going to go have a really good ride. And I just want to go and enjoy myself again. I want to experience what it's like to just ride for the fun of it. Um, but obviously I always challenge myself. So my challenge for that was I, I didn't get, I did not care about the race itself and I wasn't planning to race anybody. Um, but my goal, because it was a shorter race and I actually chose it because it was shorter because of my knees. So my knees have mm-hmm. played a factor in that because I knew after a certain point, the, the level of stress in a bike packing, when you need to have a certain amount of weight on your bike to carry the kit you need on a long distance, 
It also affects um, when you get tired, you know, all the stress starts to go to the knees and that's when they can collapse. So in this case, because it was so short, I didn't need to take much kit. So I could take, go very light and I could finish it in a certain amount of time without, you know, getting to the stage where I would get a lot of stress. And then, so I was curious because for me, it's always about pushing myself and seeing how how what my limits are, how much further I can take it for my own curiosity. And for me, it's always about um, the the competition is against myself and it's always sort of self-discovery for me. So I think that's what has been the attraction of these races. And like I was saying to you before, that's the format that racing puts you into that you force yourself to go beyond certain limitations yeah. or boundaries that you would never put yourself in if you were just going to go on a bike packing ride. So I put myself into that because I had the idea that, look, uh, on the Trans Am, I did 800 kilometers nonstop and I wanted to see if I could do a thousand kilometers nonstop. So for me, that was the goal and I wanted to see if I could do it. <laughs> um, and so that was sort of where I set my, my, um, uh, goal towards and, uh, and, and the rest was secondary, you know, whether, you know, whatever level I came in on that wasn't important. Uh, and so I, when I set off, I, I did almost because I was not in this serious racing mindset, I hardly trained for that race, but obviously the muscle memory kicks in and your body knows what it needs to do. So sure, huh? to train for that, I did one Everesting near home. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did one long, like, 300-kilometer ride. And I thought, well, look, uh, to get myself warmed up, I'll fly into um, to the United Arab Emirates. Mm -hmm. And I will cycle from there to Oman, <laughs> to the starting line. Did, did the training on the road. <laughs> yeah, just to, and also just so I could see another country, you know, nearby. And, you know, I can get, see a couple places. So that's what I did. I flew in and I... I cycled the 400 and something kilometers to the starting line um, from the UAE and mm -hmm. uh, and rested a couple of days there at the starting line and then you know the race was on and it was honestly for me one of the most fun experiences because I I was not in it for anything except I enjoyed it the the route the the people I mean it was a beautiful country really beautiful country and the people were so nice and um and i mean the sleep deprivation i think it would probably was easier that i didn't stop than if i had stopped and then you start to feel all the aches and pains when you have to wake up again after 2 hours you're like uh, you feel like every your muscles are heavy but i reached a certain point where everything was just kind of numb um and it was just kind of a dull pain and it was fine it was manageable so i just kept going and uh, and then, you know, the second night was uh, when I started to hallucinate and, you know, like the, Again. the light posts were turning into oh, sleep deprivation. You don't need drugs. Just just do sleep deprivation. It's amazing. <laughs> so the, the light posts were turning into like these giants were like looking at me as I pass and like things were coming out of the darkness and like shadows were like running next to me. And I was just like, Oh, this is amazing. <laughs> so much fun. Cause I knew I was elucidating that if I, if I, if it got to the point where I didn't know what I was doing, I would have stopped, but I was so close to the end by that point. And then the, the organizer sent me a text going slow down because you're, you're beating the front group of men. Mm -hmm. And I was like, mm -hmm. Why would I slow down? And, and that, up until that point, I didn't know. I, I didn't know my position, anything. But after that, I understood my position. I was like, oh, I'm in the front. Interesting. <laughs> and I was like, now I'm going to go. Now I'm going to go. Like, same principle as the Trans Am. I'm like, you want me to slow down? Oh, no, you don't. <laughs> so then I think that kind of woke me up again. And I got to the end. I, I had, I think I had my, I had my partner on the phone the last hour because he, he was sure I wasn't going to make it to the end because I was, he said I was talking absolute nonsense on the phone. Like he thought I was completely out of my brain. But I remember everything very clearly to this day, super intensely. I remember everything, but I couldn't find the finish line. <laughs> <laughs> and I just going around in circles and I couldn't see it. And I was like, where is it? Where is it? And I finally, I rolled up and there was Josh and he had literally arrived. He was only 10 minutes, the, the second place guy, Josh Ebert. He was only yeah, he was only five minutes ahead of me or ten minutes <laughs> ahead of me. Like I almost caught the guy. I didn't I didn't even know that. And I rolled up and he looks at me and even he was surprised. He was like, 
you know, you're, you're yeah. Okay. I was like, hey, he's like, hey. At the first place, guy was like in a sleeping blanket, like sleeping there on the road next to him. And we're all three of us sitting there, like, oh, this is interesting. <laughs> he's like, you know, you're in third place. I was like, I am. I am. Where's the where was the guy who was in front of me? He never turned up. I'm like, oh, okay, well, cool. <laughs> Why not? So yeah, no, that was a surprise. Um, and it was more of a surprise because I hadn't even tried, you know, and I wasn't even trying to race. So that, for me, that was an interesting experience. And I was like, I thought, well, you know what? This is this is this is as it should be. You know, it was an amazing experience, and I enjoyed myself so much. And I just had a great time, and I think that yeah. that's that makes a difference. That makes all the difference at the end. Uh, so I have that question. Um, you participated in different kind of races, like uh, the multi-day events, like seven days, and you did something like Trans Am, it was like three or four weeks, and you did a sprint race. Yeah. Uh, which one do you think is easier, or which one is the hardest, and which one do you prefer to race if you would race in the future? Hmm. Interesting question. I don't think I have a preference because they're the difficulties are for different reasons. They're difficult. Um, the short ones, though, are they? You know, if you have a time, um, if you have a time issue, that that's very useful because you can do it in a short amount of time. And I found that was really nice because I could uh, take less time off to. So, for example, it takes a lot more money and time to do a long one like the Trans Am. You know, you mm-hmm. you, you, you invest a lot of money and time, and I think it's less easy or realistic for some people who you know work full time or have you know family and all yeah. the rest so i think for that reason um and that's one of the reasons why i um i decided when i set up the the two volcano sprint which is the race mm-hmm. that i run now to do mm-hmm. a shorter um format mm-hmm. so that more people have the possibility of participating Um, because I've understood that the the longer the race is, the the less possibilities people have to participate in them, and it takes also more time for people to recover from them. You know, those kind of long races take a lot out of you physically and mentally. And, you know, it yeah. can take like six months. It's, it, you're basically traumatizing your body, so you suffer. <laughs> you do you suffer PTSD and all the rest, and so a shorter format is it's easier for people to train for and and take time off for and so i think that that's probably a more as far as ultra racing goes a, a much more accessible um type of race yeah i see that's um, good. okay and uh, do you have an essential piece of kit you never race without like christoph christoph said to, said to us i carry razor blade all the races <laughs> Razor blade. <laughs> <laughs> he is shaving in the race. <laughs> It's very interesting. I can't believe he shaved it, but it's true. He's never turned up to a finish line with a beard, so I thought he was just naturally hairless. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, Juliana, yours is ICT oil because you're keto. And <laughs> it was, it was, but but if you're not keto friendly. Um, yeah. The one thing that has saved me on so many occasions is duct tape. <laughs> <laughs> so you need to put uh, duct tape uh, around the ICT oil, and you if, have if one. your jacket breaks, if your bike breaks, if your your bag breaks. I mean, you just need to have duct. If you if you cut yourself, if you injure yourself, anything duct tape. <laughs> Duct tape cures everything, Bun? and duct tape and and Ziploc ties, those plastic Ziploc ties. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Those two things every cyclist has to carry. You told about as the the two volcano sprint that the race you are directing. Yes. Uh, can you tell us about the two volcano sprint? How did you decide about to direct this race? Yes, yeah, so the two volcano sprint, I actually got the original idea because when I was training for one of my races, I did a non-stop ride from one volcano to the other. I went from Mount Etna to Mount Vesuvio. Um, Super cool. Yeah, and uh, but I did the short route. <laughs> I did it. I, it was like I think six hundred and fifty kilometer ride that I did. It was following the coast. Um, but it was not ideal because certain parts of the road were very hectic with trucks and everything else. So, but I thought, what a cool 
ride and I would love for other cyclists to experience it. And I live in the south of Italy, which is very undiscovered as far as cycling goes. And when cyclists come to Italy for cycling, they always go to the Alps or to the Dolomites or to Tuscany. You know, they go to very sort of known cycling regions Mm -hmm. and nobody knows South Italy. But we have so have we have really some of the best mountains, um, just off roads countryside i mean we have such a variety uh, of landscapes and you know we have the best food we've got gorgeous weather and i'm just like my god why can't we bring some sort of attention to cycling in the south of italy and so i thought the format of going between two volcanoes and hitting all the mountains in between was really attractive <laughs> because for me that's where i go for training yes this is my my playground this is where i'm my happy places and um and I've just discovered some of the most beautiful parts of Italy here in the south. And so I thought, well, it'd be great if I could get other cyclists to come and experience this. And a lot of people are afraid of going to South Italy because it's got a reputation of being, you know, a bit abandoned, a bit chaotic, a bit, you know, uh, lawless and all the rest. But in fact, you know, so far, all the cyclists who have come to participate in this race are shocked. They never expected such nice people, such beautiful countries, such incredible food. Like they have the really best time. So I've tried to make it not just about the cycling and the race, but also a cultural experience. So they they get to experience, you know, um, the, for example, Mount Vesuvio, when it exploded, the, you know, it, it covered the city of, the Roman city of Pompeii. So right at the foot of the mountain, right before we start the race, where the starting line is where they do the registration is where the ruins of uh, Ercolano that covered, you know, the, the Roman town that got covered. Mm-hmm. Um, we do the the registration in the museum. Um, you know, at the end of the, the finish line this year, we had uh, the mayor organized a big event with, you know, wine tasting from Mount Etna vineyards, from, you know, olive oil. You know, so they get to experience the, the local cuisine, the local cultures, the local, and yeah. it's supporting locals. So this race, I, I wanted it to be about a race, but also to have people have a full 360 experience of South Italy. So they do, and they, they get, you know, people are so involved. Like these, this is only the second year, and you know there are already tons of people out on the road cheering the riders through. Like just so happy to see them, taking photos. And it was a, it was just a nice, nice event. And I wanted to bring back that sort of feeling. The, the early days of these races were where it was just about. It wasn't about money. It wasn't about shows. It was just about having a really great adventure and seeing something new and having a really good time. And so that's really what it is about. And the race is completely 100% of the proceeds from the rider registration goes towards our not-for-profit foundation, which helps to support the, the local um, sort of uh, economy around eco-sustainability, around uh, local projects that boost the economy and the environment mm-hmm. and all the rest. So it's all, it goes, all goes back into um, to the people and to the country and Nothing about making money, nothing about, you know, it's just about the joy of the experience for the riders and for the locals and the towns they pass through. And it's meant a lot. And actually, these last couple of years, ironically, kind of coincided with COVID. And we were able to help so many people through the rider funds with, you know, food packages and supplies and stuff for families who people, you know, the main main people have lost their jobs, the, the mother and father lost their jobs and the government doesn't help people very much when they're not, you know, registered uh, with a work contract. So mm-hmm. um, we've been able to help a lot of people within this sort of small communities that the riders pass through. So it was, it's really one of these, it's an event that gives back as much as the riders get out of it. They also give back to it. So, yeah. Okay. We, we are very happy to uh, know the old details about Volcano Speed Test. Uh, do you have any advice for people interested in participating and unsupported ultra races? Expect everything and fear nothing. <laughs> 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 Because on these, yeah, well, on these races, everything, everything can and probably will happen to you. And no matter how much you try to prepare or plan ahead, you know, it's it's the one thing you didn't expect that will happen, or the one thing you're not prepared for that will happen. So you actually just need to be adaptable and open to the experience. You just need to just wait for it, and you know, whatever happens, 
you will always find a solution. When there's a problem, there's a solution. So you just need to be flexible and not see it as a big, you know, you don't need to be tense or, or, or um, anxious about it. You just need to enjoy the ride and just think of it all as a grand experience because that's what it is. And it's, you're going to come out of it and having learned something new about yourself, which is the point, I think. So can we say expect the unexpected? Exactly what you need to do. To expect the unexpected. Yeah. This sentence covers uh, all the situations you can face. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, you will. You will experience everything that you didn't think, and you know the, the full range of emotions. Um, yeah. But you you'll you will come out of it with a better sense of uh, understanding yourself and your own capabilities. And interestingly, the lessons you learn on the road or in these races, they carry over into everyday life. So, you know, you just, you stop to stress so much about small things, you know, you realize like, it's not such a big deal, you know, and things happen and you really, uh, you understand that you're able to manage whatever comes your way. Um, and yeah, you just stop worrying so much about stupid things, you know, everything takes on a bigger picture. And yeah. uh, and maybe that's one of the beautiful outcomes of <laughs> doing these kind of races. Yeah. So, Juliana, uh, in this show, we have a cliche question we ask to each of our uh, guests. So, mm-hmm. here is the question for you. Which one do you prefer, Shimano or SRAM? <laughs> <laughs> well, I might be biased because when I set off around the world, my first experience was SRAM. <laughs> and it was Pegasus had a SRAM system and it broke immediately. <laughs> <laughs> and it, in the in the Trans Am bike race, my my competition Jesse was riding mm-hmm. a bike with a SRAM system, which probably okay. also broke, and he had a huge problem. With <laughs> and I looked at him and I was like, "Well, that's what you get for riding SRAM on these kind of races." Because it's going to happen. So basically, SRAM is great for short, intense racing, like on the Giro Italia or the Tour de France. It's a great system. But I think for these kind of long distance where you need to fix it yourself and you need mm-hmm. to find parts that are easy to fix, you should be going with Shimano. That's <laughs> my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's good. What do Thanks. you think? <laughs> The born of this question comes from uh, actually this. Uh, I preferred uh, Shram from the beginning and Bura preferred uh, Shimano from the beginning. Interesting. But my uh, Shrams start to be broken. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's a great but, system, but it's it's very it's very um, short life. Like you need to, yeah, on, on like a shorter yeah. race, you can do it. It's great. But on like kind of a long distance event, I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, I read your book and uh, you had an issue with the front derailleur, I think. Yes. And yeah. no one knows how to adjust. You pass countries, Nobody countries, knows. countries, but no one knows how to adjust. In fact, <laughs> in the end, I ended up just changing the whole system because it was impossible to uh, keep <laughs> fixing it. No, it's true. Like Nobody could, could, could adjust it. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's my opinion. Last question. Uh, what is your future plans? Will you participate in a gravel event? Um, I might. There's one event that interests me, um, which has both gravel and road, which is um, the race around Rwanda. Uh, Rwanda, for me, is one of the most beautiful countries right now in Africa. Fantastic mm-hmm. country. And I think it will be a really cool experience. So I think I look for places where I would really want to enjoy riding in. And for me, that's definitely one of the places I would. So I have an interest in that event. And I think also the organizers and everything, they, they, you know, it has that, for me, that feeling. And I look for that feeling now in events. So it definitely has that feeling. So that's one of them. Uh, otherwise, I don't know. As outside of racing, um, next year is my 40th. And I really, on my bucket list, so I have a bucket list now of countries. Every year I ride a new country. And not for racing, but just for fun so I did like I did um um I did South America one year I did uh Spain I did I've, I've done like a bunch of different countries that I wanted to do um but for my 40th I really want to either cycle through all of Japan or Indonesia 
That's super cool. So those are like my two like top countries right now that I want to cycle through. Um, and I just have to decide which one is more realistic <laughs> for next year. Uh, but yeah, that's on my, that's on my huge list at the moment. Yeah, that's super cool. Um, so Juliana, uh, do you have any last few words, uh, before we, uh, finish the show? Um, wow. You put me on the spot. Um, <laughs> No, not particularly. Um, yeah. Okay, so uh, let me say some few words. Uh, we really glad you to uh, have a guest in our show. Uh, Thank you. It was it, it was really really uh, cool uh, conversation. Uh, so we really like to uh, thank you about that and. Uh, maybe hope to uh, have you as a guest in the uh, next years about your new experiences. Absolutely, I would love I would love to chat with you anytime. I've enjoyed myself very much. Thank you. Thanks for for inviting me. Um, it means a lot. Uh, thank you. Uh, so this is the end of the 16th episode of the Gravel Diggers podcast, and thanks everyone uh, listening to our podcast. Uh, take care and goodbye.